very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Ruben, for having invited me here and to the organizers of, the, of this conference. I think uh, that it was a very good choice to uh, uh, include some presentation on analytics. I mean, this top or this last uh, layer of, of big data and uh, to give it, to treat it like a, like a workshop. Uh, this is a workshop, in fact. Uh, I think that most of you will have uh, read or even downloaded a virtual machine from, uh, I don't know if this is true or not, but where this is going to be interactive. You were supposed, in fact, you were supposed to, uh, uh, because, because of the light, I cannot see your faces very well, so I don't know if you, if you uh, are looking at me in, 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 su in surprise or, or you are already re ready to, to work on in this fashion, but, uh, you know, anyway. Uh, you were supposed to have this virtual machine downloaded if you want to follow this and interact with the code I'm going to provide. Um, uh, before I speak or say anything else, uh, the thing that you, well, that you should be doing is to uh, start um, VirtualBox. You know, the you should have checked it that everything works at home and everything, and have it open, and uh, and start your uh, your machine. Okay. Uh, while it starts, um, let me go to the formal presentation. Start with the formal presentation at the beginning. Uh, we will go and, and, and work on this virtual machine later on, but I want to, to make some, uh, some comments. Well, first of all, you know, this is the name of the presentation, Big Data Analytics with R and Hadoop. Uh, this is only one of the options, possible options to do analytics on big data, R and Hadoop. There are many others, but I'm going to concentrate on these ones. My name, of course, uh, my contact, and uh, I should say that I am a mathematician, and as opposed to many people who have been presenting things here who are engineers and, and things like this. And I also say, should say that I work as a freelance statistician and you know, even a kind of old-fashioned statistician, old school, okay? in many senses. Um, for in one, of the, one of the things that happens when you are an old-school statistician is that uh, um, you get uh, nervous when people say machine learning. You know, machines don't learn. I try, um, anyway, I'm going to talk about that a bit later, but uh, uh, computers are actually quite uh, stupid. In fact, uh, you, there is a lot of love you have to give them so that they can start doing things. You know, that seems like learning, but this is not actually learning. Uh, let me see the table of contents. We are going to start talking about Hadoop and R. You are going to learn everything about Hadoop and everything about R in four slides. And then we will go into, into uh, you know, something more practical. I give you time to start the virtual machine and everything while we cover this, when we learn everything about Hadoop and everything about uh, R. Mm. First of all, a file system. A file, a file system, what is a file system? Everything starts with that. File system is a system, or system, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't talk like that, that manages you know, files. And actually, I brought with me one of the first file systems I was using when I was 12. I brought it here, I have it around here. It is like this. This is where I kept my games for the Spectrum machine. And uh, the software that managed it and the hardware was me with a pen. And I would do things, things like this to, you know, to move to my next game, things like this. Have you ever done it? Well, uh, you know, look, looking for a place where I can, I can save my next game and play the game I wanted and blah, blah, blah. So this is the kind of things that later on, you know, machines started to, to, to learn to do by themselves. And then you have like diskettes, hard disks, they came later, writes, magnetic tapes should be at the beginning. And they do things like finding a space to write your files, manage fragmentation, write and write files. Uh, and, and also for some time people have like, a, well, or everybody, everybody made like this association, one machine, one device, one file system. The fact is that it is not quite true. And we started to see things like, well, at the beginning is one diskette, one file system. But at the, uh, we started to work with, with uh, devices that contain several file systems, like partition uh, hard disks. And there was a time where we started to work with file systems that spread over different disks or different machines. We work with writes, different levels of replication. And suddenly we have Hadoop, for instance, which is another file system where you put things and is distributed or placed, the information is placed on different machines. 
Uh, what are the goodies about Hadoop as a file system? Well, it, you know, we have big files, it's prepared to big files, it chunks them, distributes them among, among machines and other things that you know, uh, software engineers have been uh, willing to include in this very nice file system, prepared to store big amounts of data. Obviously, it requires you know, things that you know, keep track of what servers are up and down, blah, blah, blah. But this is, you know, uh, at the end, this is just another file system we have seen, we have been working in the last in my case, in the last uh, 25 years. Just uh, <coughs> How do you work with this file system? Well, it provides some tools, like we will work with them later, like LS to see the files that are uh, over there, copy, blah, blah, blah. You can put, get data to and from your file system to Hadoop. And, uh, well, and then you say, then you say, well, normally when you have you know, files somewhere, in some device, you say I want to operate with it. You say I, I copy it to my hard disk and I open, you know, GIMP, Photoshop, Word, whatever, to to process it. In this case, uh, the kind of files that you are working with will help. Uh, you cannot do that because uh, they usually don't fit in one machine. Somehow, you cannot uh, open it in your machine. You cannot do anything on your machine because. They are too large. The solution that these people implemented is we are going to provide users of Hadoop a system that instead of bringing data to your computer, is going to move your programs to the where the data is. And this is essentially what they implemented. One of these ways to distribute your code to you know where the data is is called MapReduce, and we will be using it to solve our problems. Uh, uh, map reviews. What is map reviews? It's a two-step process. You have a map, and then you have a reviews. In the map, you uh, you, know, you, know, you send your code to places, trans there, and in the reviews part, the pieces, you know, the result is gathered together, put together, and and returned to your machine. And Hadoop has nice features like control system failures, and many things that you know that uh, a few years ago when people were doing parallelism using these kinds of technologies, uh, OpenMP, MPI, and things, made their life very miserable. Oh, somebody has done it over there, it seems. Um, it has an exotic approach. I mean, um, mm, this framework provides you like a place where you put your own code, and everything else is, is managed by the system. We will learn how to put the code we want in the place we, we need so that we can solve a few problems. And of course, the code is for you to provide. Uh, let me see if we have uh, started this. If you have uh, started the, the virtual machine, we are going to jump from the presentation to to um, to other place. To um, I invite you to um, go to localhost. You have two two ports open at least where you can see what's going on in the machine. You have the job tracker. We will be we will see what this this what this is for. And uh, we are going to see R for the first time, at least today, which is in the port 8787 in localhost. Uh, so if you are here, everything is fine in installation. Uh, have you managed to be to arrive here? Uh, something else that we will be using is uh, SSH. We can SSH to the machine, to the virtual machine, uh, to the port two, 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 two. Uh, with password R Hadoop. And there you are. Uh, if you want to see, if you want to see a command in Hadoop, Let's do a very simple one. The file system, file system command, ls, shows you the files that you have in your home directory or the directory of R Hadoop in, in side Hadoop. Uh, it's too small, isn't it? Can you read it? Well, th th this is, you are, you are doing an ls not on your operative system, not on your local machine. You are doing an ls on this mm, new file system that is uh, nobody really knows where, but in fact, in this case, it is inside the same machine, actually in a machine inside your machine. But it could be 
uh, elsewhere and it could be uh, distributed and so on. Okay. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Let me let me go just one slide to talk about R. Let me show you a slide about R. Uh, nobody really knows how to define it, what is the right uh, um, overarching word to describe it. Some people say it is a software package uh, because of its similitude to previous uh, uh, computer packages that were called packages because they did statistics. It's a traditional name for this. Uh, but it is really not. Uh, some people say it is a programming language, which is partially true. Computer scientists who see it start saying that it is a bit crappy. No, it doesn't qualify as a very nice and very beautiful computer language, because actually it's not like a computer, like a regular computer language. Uh, it is mostly intended for uh, interactive processing. Um, because you want to work interactively, well, it is prepared to be interactive. It is true that you can put or designs of code or do programs uh, and run them together, but uh, I spend 99% of my time working with it interactively. In fact, when everything is pretty and runs and blah, 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 then it's not my job anymore to work with that. So, you know, uh, it's not, some people would complain about it as a computer language. Uh, some people, because of that, say yeah, it is just an environment, an environment which means nothing. Uh, the important part is what comes later. That helps you do that analysis and graphics, essentially. Mm. This is, this is our. Um, there is a lot of uh, movement around R and big data. And in some sense, it fits quite well together. They fit quite well together because uh, the way people should program in R, which is very close to functional language, uh, re resembles very much this map reduce approach. Yeah. Uh, here you have an example of code in, in R, which is, is saying, is doing the following. is taking a table, DFX, is splitting it by group and sex, and is applying the function summarize. Function summarize with arguments, you know, create a mean as the mean of the data and create a standard deviation as standard deviation of h. And when you compute that, re uh, return that to me uh, in the form of a data frame or of another data frame. This is the reduce part. So in some sense, you are doing map. You are sending this function summarize to different uh, calls of function summarize on sections from this data frame and put them in the map part and put them back all together in the reduce part. Very similar to what uh, we will be doing later on. Uh, in fact, this is not essentially map reduce. It is another, it's another framework called split, apply, combine, but you know, more or less translates to the same stuff. Uh, the actual implementation uh, means that you know, in the actual implementation, this would run sequentially in your computer, but nobody is telling you that in 50 years, this code will not run distributors mm, somewhere else without changing the, the code itself. Only the implementation could change. Right? And um, having said that, after learning everything we should know about Hadoop and R, let me start with, uh, with something closer to something practical. Um, let me start with counting. I, I couldn't resist the temptation to start with counting. Everybody does in these kind of workshops. And, uh, but instead of counting uh, words in text, which is what every, everybody does, I'm going to count hexagons. And this will serve me as an excuse to introduce a big theme that has been touched already. Um, in many cases, we, what we want to produce as uh, statisticians is graphics. Uh, graphics because uh, I think it is my own uh, it's an old feeling. Some people, some people agree with me, but you know, I strongly agree that the way the, the, the vocabulary you have to use as statistician technical people uh, with uh, the public in general is through graphics. Uh, and it is an art to express complex relationships in data with good graphics. 
and we uh, there, is there is a lot of theory. We have had two presentations on graphics today. I could only see one. They they strive they strive on the on the artistic part of the of the presentation, but sometimes you know the the the, the scientific part is a bit is not as rigorous as it should be. I I'm quite bad at the artistic part, but I I'm quite serious with the with the scientific part or how to express how to convey information, complex information with graphics. I'm not that, that successful, but at least I, I, try, I, do my, I do my best. And this, this book de uh, deals with this, de with this problem, how to do graphs, how to explain to people what's going on in large data sets. And uh, it's not at all, but still they use the, the visualizing a million subtitle, like, like if one million were big enough. Right? It's not big, but you know. Examples of things people are doing is this, you know, this is a complex graph, but if you forget about what you see and, and think how you build these things, actually what you're doing is counting. You are aggregating. It's a group by we have seen before, right? You group by by the variable on the x-axis, on the y-axis, and you count how many cases you have, uh, and you only have to count also the, mm, the red against the, the yellow part. No, it's, it's a group by with three variables count, and then you can plot this. Y you can give this table to someone, and they plot it. But uh, still, you can see things. You can see a structure, non-trivial structure there. I, I don't know what this data represents, but you know, uh, it's something that that uh, that uh, might convey, you know, some information, some non-trivial information. And mean mind that everything you do here actually is counting. We have been doing counting on big data today, and we have seen presentations on how to count, you know, group by, blah, blah, blah. Hi, everything works here. Uh, this is another example. This is a big table, probably it's from the census, the US census. And then you have a huge table, 3, 000, uh, 300 million people in the US, blah, blah, blah. And then you, ca you are able, again, by counting, to have a visual representation of that information, of the whole information. You see the age, and you see how the you know the marital status changes. Probably there will be more widowers at the bottom. The top is young people are younger. Blah blah blah. Yeah. It's no non-trivial visual representations of data, and we will do our first exercise in this field. And because just counting, counting like we could do with uh, with uh, mm, with SQL or Hive or similar uh, tools that you know that. Uh, give you a traditional interface to, to big data, we're going to do something which is a bit more uh, different. We're going to count hexagons. We're going to have a cloud of points, and then mm, we will see how many of them fall into the same hexagon, which is not difficult, but. Um, so we will start running. We will enter uh, our studio. User are Hadoop, uh, the, the, the password is the same, and our studio should start. Yes, it does. Okay. I have a problem here in the files. Because I have files in a directory called Big Data Spain Workshop, and this is the code we are going to be reviewing today. This if you order in alphabetical order, this is the, the order we are going to be working with. And yeah. I show you. I show you the first piece of code here. Um, I don't know if you can read up there. Maybe I should make it bigger. Shall I? Yes. Uh, now the question is how. Uh, what is? Okay. Okay. First, we're going to load some libraries. I created a function here. If you want to see, have a look at it, mm, do it. If not, it's not that important. That calculates, given a x and y coordinates of points and some parameter, calculates, a, mm, gives you a table with the centers, and the number of points that fall into this one. And then a function that plots it. We are going to, t to test it on a small piece of data. And we run it. Mm. 
and it aggregates. It's a, it's a, it's a normal uh, cloud of numbers. It aggregates uh, uh, and plots it. Mm. The function is not that relevant because usually what we want to do is to uh, um, use functions created by other people and the only thing we are actually interested in is being able to uh, mm, use them in big data environments. Uh, apply them to data sets that are too big to fit in memory because uh, for data, the for data this, this big yeah, is, is trivial. Okay. <coughs> so let's start using Hadoop. Let's use the, the library um, RMR2 that connects to the Hadoop framework. Um, I added here the, the codes you would use to create the file that we're going to be using in case you want to tra try it at home or change something. And everything you need, we will see, we will see wh while it runs, but everything you need is to define what is your input, what is your output, and what is your map function. You say that you are going to be reading this file that is in your Hadoop system. The format of this file is CSV because I have created it as such. I forget about the option, it's not that relevant. And uh, the, fun the map function I'm going to use is this one. Essentially, it's just a call to my function, xbin. Mm. Hadoop or MapReduce requires that I embed this, this call to my function in a key, a key val mm, thing. I have to give keys and values so that uh, yeah, this is how it works. But essentially, uh, in this case, I give the same key to everything, and I, what I say is just calculate on the on the on the right on the right part the values that I'm passing you in v as x. You know, I take take the first column as as x, take the same column as y, and calculate my hexagons. And what you have here, I want to run it because uh, it takes, you will see it takes some time. I, th I think my previous is going to be the new compile, need a new compiling. Have you seen this joke of two people who are fighting with swords at, at work and the boss comes and says, what are you doing? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. And they say, compiling, same. It's about the same, okay? Uh, now it's starting. Now it's starting. We can we can uh, take this uh, opportunity to go to see the, the this administration screen and see, for instance, here you have the running jobs, which are none at the moment because we didn't refresh. But if we refresh, we will see our job. No, still not refresh. Oh yeah. We should see it eventually. Ah, it's running. It's running, our job is running. And if, you, if you go click, 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 you will see things going on. You, s you will see that you have two maps. Both of them are running. If you continue clicking, you will see you know, the state in which they are. If they fail, you will see what's going on, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But important thing, well, here in the log also, you can see what's going on. You should see it in the console. Yes, is 71% running. While it ends, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you essentially uh, what. Uh, sorry, what is what you have to define to run a map reduce job. The only things you have to define. You have to give the input and say, you know, notation. You just check it in the help pages or check it. Google will tell you exactly how it works. But essentially, what you need to give it is text. If you are indicate, indica sorry, indicating the type of input, if it's going to be text, an R object, whatever, options associated to the input type, like the separator you are going to use, the output you are going to have, where you are, you are going to store it, if you want it to return to memory or if you want to save it in, in, in Hadoop, and then the map and reduce functions. The map and reduce functions are functions with KV argument, where key is the key and V is the value. And they return a list with k and v, which means the input and the output are like coherent. One of them. This allows you, for instance, to chain and produce jobs, because they have to have the same. They have the same output as is required by the input. We will see the bits as we go to. Um, 
here. Ah, here you have the solution already. Um, let me let me do let me see how the output what the output looks like. The output is an object I call res. Hmm? The output of one reduce is something I call res, which is an object of length two. What uh, what are its, uh, its names? It's called k and val. As I, as I says, what it returns is something that contains keys and values. What is the length of the of the key? It has length 101, quite surprisingly. surprisingly. Um, what is the key? We define to be one always, so I'm going to have ones. We were not very uh, um, sophisticated with the key. The important part, the important part is the is the values, the values. We're going to see them, but essentially. I'm going to run here something very close to MapReduce, but in memory, I'll apply. I'm going to see I'm go values is going to be a list of or a vector of, of values, return values. I'm going to see the dimension of all these of all these values, and if I run it, I get you know I have a list of uh, what I have in in, in values it is a list of 101 data frames with three columns and a variable number of rows. If you want to see any of them. Uh, you type, um, you type, uh, uh, mm. this is the, the beginning of one of these pieces of, of that map the mapper is giving you back. It tells you that in the, in the, uh, hexagon with center at minus 3.6 and minus 1.9, you have one observation. In the hexagon below, you have four, blah, 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 blah. Uh, if you, you can put all these results together, you can, rbind means put all these tables, you know, join them, join them like uh, not side by side on top, like pile them. Pile them, all of them. Uh, you can tell it to summarize the results and aggregate by a coordinate by center of hexagon. And then you plot and you have a nice distribution again, like same picture. Uh, one interesting feature that, that here mm, of big data that, that emerges here is that if you compare this graph to the previous one, the crown around the center is much bigger with big data, with bigger data, with larger data, which means that you have more outliers. You have more information on the tails that you have with the small data. This is a feature we will see again later on. Um, you can get, you can even build map reduce with mappers and reducers. The job I did later on of, of, of piling up the output of point mappers, you can do it in a reduce job. And then you define a reduce function that essentially what it's going to do is to take the V, the results, and it's going to put them in a pile and summarize the thing we did before and just return a single object that you can print, that you can plot. And if you run this, you will do the same. You will spend the same time there. there. Ah, sorry. Is my mouse. As you run this, you define your, your map reduce job here with input, the mapper, your mapper, your, your reduce. And it should be running. And it should be running. It's going to run map first, then it's going to do the reduce. And now we didn't have to do any kind of uh, work later on because everything was already, everything has already been put together by the reducer. And it's running. Um, you can do this, I tell you, I'm going to leave it as an exercise. You can do this with fancier keys. 
you can instead of aggregating all the hexagons and giving a key equal to one, which means that every uh, all the data will go to the same reducer, you can say I'm going to put the x coordinate as the key, and then the reducer will only each reducer will aggregate only um, hexagons with the same x value. So we will distribute better your task among reducers. In this case, data is not that big so that, that we should worry about it. But you can play if you, because you have your the virtual machine, you can play with other options and compare them and see if you like them or you don't like them. But essentially it's the same code with different, uh, the same code always, the same function, but with different mm, approaches to different selections or options of what to select as key, what not to select as key. Essentially, the answer should be the same. I mean, the, the graph should be the same in any case. This is a counting. Um, because you are enforcing, because you are enforcing this strict uh, form in out input and output, that you are going to have key value pairs. Uh, it is possible to, as I said, to concatenate jobs. It is possible that the output of one is going to be the input of the next one, which is good sometimes when you want to iterate. Mm, some fitting some algorithms requires iteration, and then you can use the input of, you know, you can just make a loop there if you need it. I'm going to show you a very simple example of concatenation that also illustrates the speed of this. This is this is the output of the of my hexagon algorithm as well again. <coughs> this example is much simpler. Uh, you have a function here, I define a function that takes x, whatever x is, uh, takes a object prepared to map reduce like input of a map reduce job and essentially what what is going to do is to apply the map function which is going to have always the same key and as value the square of the values of the input so you are going to pass it like a vector and it's going to to give you the square of it as simple as that uh, if I, I define my function it runs and I can say, please square to me the vector 1 to 10. Okay. So this function here takes my vector 1 to 10 that is in memory, puts it, copies it to the to Hadoop, and then the function is going to try to make the square of it. It's going to do it, actually, in fact. Run. And it starts thinking. It's uh, the, the overhead you had at the beginning uh, is quite uh, important. But it's going you at, the, at the end it's going to give you the numbers from 1 to 10 squared to the, to the square. Uh, while we wait for this, I'm going to show you, I want to show you what is going on underneath. <coughs> yeah, for technical, we will see more of this later. But essentially what happens, what you'll see is that this command is running in the cluster. This is a, a Unix command, actually. Hadoop is the is an environment variable that points to the Hadoop, the Hadoop program. What we said. With the option jar, what it's doing is to call a jar file, which is Hadoop streaming. Uh, Hadoop streaming is a Streaming is this path in the operative in the in your disk is a jar file, and this jar file is in charge. What this jar file what this jar uh, does is to take um, together with some options. What it does is to take the input. Well, it defines an input. It defines an output. It defines a function that is 
what is going behind mapper as a mapper function. It moves some files from your operat from your hard disk to wherever, you know, to the nodes where it's going to run. So physically copies, uh, streams somehow, serializes and copies it somewhere else in the in the in the in the hard disk where this is going to run. All the information you need. And is in charge of running the mapper. If you have if you have a reducer, it would it would be here listed as well. So essentially, what's going on, and particularly if you are using R, what it's doing is that one of these files is going to have everything you have in memory, like an image of your memory, <laughs> is copied in disk, serialized, copied to destination, then read by the new sessions of R in destination, so that the environment that you are going to have in the nodes where this is running is essentially the same you have in the origin. Yeah, not a very clean solution, because sometimes you have data in memory that you don't want to you know, serialize. But anyway, it works. And you can use this code or code similar to this one to, uh, you know, to serialize your own scripts. Uh, sometimes I use it to run Python rather than R. Or we will see that you can run R without, you know, without going to uh, this kind of uh, environment or a Wii or anything. <coughs> Oops. Well, this finished, this ended, and you have the squares of the numbers. If you call this twice, as here, uh, you will see that you will have two mappers running one, sorry, two jobs running one after the other, and the answer is going to be the square of this other vector. So the the small one is going to be one, and the biggest one is going to be uh, ten thousand. Um, running it if you wish, but you know this is a way, an example, a very trivial example of concatenation, concatenation of jobs. If you are interested in in going in this uh, area of moving in this area, um, this is about you know thi these were technicalities, how to count at the beginning, how this works, uh, input output map reducer. Um, le let me get into actual work that you can do with this. We can do with uh, with R and MapReduce, uh, and we have three kinds of uh, tasks. W uh, one that I like very much is scoring. Uh, up to up to very recently, uh, what happened is that uh, if you build a model, this model has to go into production. If you have to put your model into production, it means that somebody is going to have to. In some cases, I have seen like trees, decision trees, being rewritten in SQL, uh, which is a very tedious and prone to error uh, task. Uh, if you are using R and you are in this environment where you can uh, where you can map your code, your own code to to you know, on your own system, not you don't you are not uh, tied to uh, a language like SQL or whatever, but you can run R in your nodes. Uh, what you can do is to take the code that somebody is, is, pr is providing you and predict on your own data using exactly the same code that they gave you. And let me see, let me see an example. Let me work through an example here. Mm. I'm, using, I'm using a model here like GAM, GAM model, generalized additive model, which is a, an alternative model, alternative to things like logistic regression. Uh, this is for plots. Let me simulate some data first using this function that simulates data that fit into this uh, in for which GAM models are, are good. And let me uh, fit the model. Th this would be the work that some consultants somewhere are doing. They have the data you provided to them, and they say that this model that we are going to fit is the right one for your business, the right one for your problem, and they calculate it. It takes some time, not that much. And what we will do later on will be to save it in a file. No, we haven't seen it, we haven't done it, we are saving it, and we're going to erase everything from memory. So your model, the model you built, is going to be a file. We're going to do as if these consultants, they send it to us by mail or something. This is your model, test it. Okay? Take some time, I don't know why. Any object that you create? Five minutes to end? Seriously? Wow. 
I was scratching the surface of all of it. Anyway, <coughs> uh, takes. Well, takes some time. Th these things are not trivial. The idea is when, well, this finished. Well, I can save. I save it. Any object you create with R, you can save it. You can you can serialize it to the hard disk, and it is in your hard disk. You can load it, and it will be there. It will can be code, can be anything. So in this case, what you have is a model. You erase everything from memory, and what you can do, what you can do is to generate a new data set. You write it to your Hadoop system directly, like using the file system commands. And after that happens, you can load your model. Here it is that they send it to, that they send to you. And you prepare a, a scoring function that is going to be your mapper that is going to run over your data and provide you a score. Let me do this one. After you that, you redu you reduce. And you will have this, so why not? While it, while it runs, I will tell you. I will tell you a few more things. Uh, sampling, sampling is something that you do all the time. You have to do it. You are doing big data. Sampling works, and this is a way to reduce your big thing to something more. You can work in memory. Working in memory is great, uh, and it is like a paradise we don't want to be expelled from regardless of the promises of big data. So it works. Running simulations, I have an example of how to run simulations. The people say uh, Hadoop is to uh, you know, process data, but sometimes we want to generate data, but not reading. Uh, and Hadoop, uh, you know, if you go to internet, I don't it is full of people asking, how can I simulate? And I have an example how to simulate, how to use this big infrastructure, not to crunch data, but maybe to produce data or to create models that require a lot of simulation, or just to do simulation. And I have an example to calculate very inefficiently by uh, using Hadoop. Mm. Um, the, the big, most of the code I was going to show you was going to be about uh, calculating linear regressions and, and logistic regressions. For instance, linear regressions are very easy to calculate in this environment because they are line by line. If you have linear regression like that, you know, the coefficients, it's just a case, you know, case by case addition. And calculating, estimating linear, linear models is so easy. And so easy that, you know, even in relational databases are doing it today. They have code also over there to calculate the coefficients, but nothing too relevant. Uh, this is a bit of algebra to scare you, but uh, I have no time for that. Everybody is asking about uh, logistic regression, and the answer is, can they, they do it in, in this environment? The answer is no. Logistic regression is not amenable to parallelization. In some, to some extent. M m no. Logistic regression, you, you fit logistic regression but iteratively. All these iterations can be parallelized, but essentially it is iterative. It's not something that you map and then put the pieces together and, redu and you have the answer. The answer, the big answer is no. But the good news is that you don't really need logistic regression. Um, because um, I want to go into this. How many bytes? How many bytes? Uh, I will finish with this. Uh, how many bytes uh, are knowledge about your big data set? If you fit logistic regression, maybe you have 10, uh, 10 coefficients. 10 coefficients maybe are like 80 bytes. Do you think that 80 bytes describe your population of customers? The answer is essentially no, a big resounding no. If you have, uh, if you have a population, big population, this is, this is real data like this, and you have different ages, and uh, you see the behavior of young people and old people, you see it's different. One thing you can do when you have big data, and this is what I say, some people call this like the big tail of big data, and I call it the fractal nature of big data, is that when you concentrate on the younger people, you still have a huge data set to try to predict behavior of young people. If you were working through small data, what you would see is an outlier. You would say, oh, these people are the outliers. 
what you have in big data is still more data. As you go deep, you still see more data. It's like fractals, right? That you see structure as you go down. Um, <coughs> and the same for older people. So my proposal for, and this is relatively new and all, I don't know how, how new this is, for a logistic regression was going to be, instead of trying to fit a single model, what I'm going to do is to break my population in pieces where I think the behavior is different so that uh, at every leaf, which is already small data, I can build a logistic model. And this logistic model is going to give information only on that population that I want to see. And also I can see the coefficients and understand how this population differs, how the behavior of population differs at every level. Which is, uh, this is an approach that I think is the right approach to big data, where uh, <coughs> it's not fix fitting the same old models as you were doing, but uh, um, profiting from the abundance of information to look for uh, behavior, different behavior on things that before you thought it was outliers and now become niche regions okay, of interest. Uh, the code is in your bit in the virtual machine. I think it's worth having a look at it. But I don't have time to. People are doing things with uh, logistic models and, sorry, with trees and random forests as alternative to logistic models which can be paralyzed in different ways, but I will not go into that. I wanted to finish, I wanted to finish with, only with this. Uh, it's very unfortunate uh, that we didn't have time to, to go mo to see more of the code. And you were going to see a lot of code for linear regression, for logistic regression, everything. And I was going to tell you, I mean, I, I don't have a strong personality enough to prepare a workshop that is so different from every other workshop. And everybody is asking about linear models and logistic models. Yesterday, this guy, from Barclays, a good friend of mine told me, uh, have you done logistic regression for tomorrow? And I said, no, don't ask me that to me. All right. Everybody's asking me that, that to me. Uh, not, not you, please, but he did. Uh, and people think that it is big data. I think people are striving a lot to, uh, to bring into this new environment the old things they were doing. Linear models are 200 years ago. Uh, people think it's Gauss who invented them. We're talking about uh, uh, 1795, 1805. It's about that time. People are still people still want to build them now. I mean, forget about it. Logistic regression is about 70 years old. Some people say 150. Do you still want to do that today? The answer is a resounding no. Uh, big data calls for new methods to analyze data. You are not satisfied with a few coefficients. And uh, these workshops like the one I'm doing today so badly, uh, for some reason concentrate on these old models that I don't want to hear to hear about anymore in my whole life, including things like comings and things like that that you know I have to do them too too you know because it's what I have to I work and my customers pay to me to do that but you know I don't want to do that anymore I have done it they have been doing this for the last sixty years I'm bored of that. But however, however, there are other fields where they are doing, you know, you know when, when you talk about big data, it's because you have problems that actually go beyond what you can do with machines like this, which is 600 euros, okay? You need big, you know, big. You want something big. And I have been working in things like uh, social network analysis, text analysis, and this is where you need, you feel that you need uh, big, you know, canons. And the models they are doing there, I think they are very promising, very promising in, in marketing as well. Things like uh, applications where, where uh, logistic regressions and simple models have been kings. Mm. For instance, when you do logistic regression, you assume that every observation is independent of each other. Mm? When you do linear models as well, this is essential. You know, the error is uncorrelated, they say, but it is not true. It is certainly not true. People are correlated. Correlation depends on things like, you know, uh, how close are you to the other? Uh, people are doing things like a small area estimation. Small area estimation is what is happening in a small village. When you estimate what happens in a village, anything can happen in a small village. The, 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 what say, the rate of, of cancer can be 10% because 10 people live there and one got cancer. Okay? 
when you do a smaller estimation, what you do is to aggregate to to uh, to mm, smooth information with things you have around. When you are doing talking with people, you have distances between people. You have similarities. The effect of the behavior of one person depends on the effect of other persons who are similar to, to them. And these things, these models don't, cannot deal with, but new models can. And this is what doesn't fit. I'm very bad at fitting content in one hour and a quarter, but uh, that would be impossible to explain, but this, like the promise, I, thi I think it's a promise of big data in this uh, world of uh, prediction and analysis and explaining behaviors of things. And I'm very sorry that it could not be as interactive and I calculated so badly the time. I tell you something, uh, you know, I'm a mathematician, I'm a bit upset-minded, and until very recently I thought I had four hours. Then I checked last week, I checked the time and I had, I have been eliminating content, 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 and still I calculate so badly. Uh, I like all these things so much that I could be talking. If you want to, if this is going to be a movie, we, we leave. But if not, if you want to continue, we, I stay here and I continue talking about these things because <laughs> I like it so much. Anyway, uh, s uh, yeah, I have a slide where it says thank you and questions. And I will be pleased to answer any if you have. Actually, Carlos, it wasn't your fault at all. I think I miscalculated the time as well. Uh, you, so yeah. there, it, there it goes. It's, uh, you can blame me. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's all my fault. It's all my fault. No, no, definitely not. So um, we are all quite uh, wary now, but shoot some questions if there are any. Yeah, please, there, over there, at the top of the. Thank yeah. you. Um, well, uh, as a back uh, hello. <laughs> as a background, I just only tell, I used only R to compute some simplex, so I'm not, I, I don't have much. Yes. Uh, uh, oh. um, what I want to say is that the idea I have after your talk is that with m R and Hadoop, the only thing you can do is just create some map reduce, uh, just a job, like yes. when we have to program a map and the reduce and in the hardest way. I mean, uh, if you take the idea not talking about the last you comment about that data uh, data scientist that yes. is interesting too, but about using Hadoop um, really is the the hardest way as it is implemented. Isn't there just a, a library or something <laughs> I like to easy this all of this? Uh, yes, there is some uh, libraries facilitating the work of doing some calculations in Hadoop for some particular tasks. Yes, and actually, very recently, you had one, I haven't been able to test it yet, uh, for doing um, this kind of, uh, you know, PLIR library, P-L-Y-R. This is being ported to, to MapReduce, or at least I, so they claim. Uh, the thing is that if you are, you know, uh, having to move from memory to other things is always a pain. Uh, and I think this is about the least of the pain you can get. If you want to program this in uh, in Java, it's going to be much harder. And if you look at my virtual machine and go to the directory called Simula, you are going to see a short simulation that is very is very that that is much simpler. I think I think this would be about the simpler you can get, and it's not as complicated as it might be. It's, it may have it might have sounded here, and it is actually very uh, how do you say mechanical. You do it once, yeah. You have it. You master it. Uh, well, map reduces. I I really don't think the same. I mean, if you have to deal with map and reduce and implement it and and changing jobs, uh, it's not that easy in my point of view. It's well, nothing I, I easy. I mean, it's, it's, and, it's but anyway, just a suggestion. Another way of seeing it um, to implementing R would be something more like Pig or something more like Pig. That's the the real thing. So some people are working in abstracting. And it will take some time. When I wrote this this code of R in the, at the beginning, I said this is like MapReduce. Some people are working in abstracting the implementation, so that uh, you see you still run that, and something will happen. It will be in parallel. It will be somewhere. This is this is the this is the, the what people are looking forward to, but it will take some time. In and the meanwhile, we'll, you will still have to you know go through that. But uh, I agree. I, 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 I like in-memory processing. But when I say I like in-memory pre 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 uh, processing, people think that I'm talking about HANA. And it's not true. I mean, I, I, I want to continue working as I have been doing so far. And I tell you something. The other day, because of a mistake, I could load a data frame of 115 million rows. 
and four columns in memory. Uh, which is which is my record, personal record. It's, <laughs> it's five times, four ti uh, six times as bigger, as big as the previous one. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, uh, and you don't have a company in this country with so many customers. So, yeah, you you can already put, you know, uh, databases I was working with in 2004 that we use were using like SQL Server and blah blah blah. Uh, I can fit them in memory right now. So, yeah. Well, the, uh, good, the good news is that we will be working in memory very soon and you will not have these problems. I, I will comment that because in the company where I come from, uh, there's a project about public sanity and they are uh, thinking about using R and so with Hadoop or something like that. Well, I would take some comments and hope this will get better and better because it, it seems will. quite it, fine. It, it will, it will. Thank you. Welcome. Anyone else? Yeah, in the middle. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, er, um, it seems that everybody is talking about MapReduce. Yes. And uh, in your opinion, in in the field of uh, predictive analytics or machine learning, uh, what problems fit the best, or what algorithms fit the best, and what the worst with uh, MapReduce, <coughs> and what alternatives in case of a uh, worst fit of MapReduce you propose? I, that's a tough question. The ones that fit the best are the, are the worst ones, like linear regression. Because, you know, these, <laughs> things, these things are, are, are used because uh, com statistics has a problem. Statistics was invented before computers. And because it was invented before computers, uh, people started using uh, solutions on tools that were easy to compute and not the ones that were both best for problems. So uh, everything traditional will be easy to implement in, in Hadoop, but uh, we want to do other things. For instance, this morning we were talking about comparing, you know, at some, in some sense you have to compare uh, distances between two points. This morning we have distances between two airports. But what happens? Airports are like maybe 1,000 important airports. That's, it, that's a matrix of 1 million, you know, 1 million. 1,000, 1,000, 1 million. One million comparisons, that is very easy. One mo it's not one million, it's uh, half a million, right? But if you want to take, you have one million customers, you want to compare all of them, that's a bit tricky. Uh, I think distances are very important, and probably uh, a system that allows you to cal calculate distances between pairs of points, or you have some heuristics to avoid having to calculate that many when it's not, it's not going to be relevant, would be something very good in many cases. Uh, and I'm still looking for it. I, I can do it for, sm for smaller data sets or for samples or things, but I would like to do it in massively. And uh, I'm a bit f still far from it. Okay. Welcome. All right, so I think with this we should finish for the sake of uh, the program. I don't know, Carlos, how you managed to make uh, statistics so inspirational. So thank you very much to everybody. Well.